All right, welcome to the Big Texas Podcast, the third of three in a row interviews with candidates from HD 47. Uh, shout out to the other two candidates in this race. We would love to have you come on the podcast. Uh, hit us up on Instagram and Twitter at Big Texas Podcast or go to the Texas Young Republicans Facebook page and reach out to us. We'd love to set something up, have you come down to RPTHQ where we have set up temporary shop, our home away from home to be able able to host this podcast, bring guests in, talk about the policies and issues that they are reaching out to voters about. Before I get to my guest, a little bit of housekeeping, a reminder once again, next week, when this comes out next week, January 21st is the start of early voting in the special election runoffs for House District 28 and House District 148. Uh, that's where Gary Gates is running in HD 28 to replace John Zerwas and Louis LaRota, a friend of the podcast endorsed by Texas Young Republicans, is running to become the first Republican representative for House District 148. Again, early voting for that race starts on January 21st. Election day is January 28th. If you want to learn more about it or how to get involved, make sure you sign up at texasyr.gop or follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all that fun stuff. Now, my guest today, HD 47 candidate Jenny Roan Forge. Uh, Jenny is uh, so fun. I had a great time talking to her. She is our first female candidate on the show, and we could not be more pleased to be able to bring some female candidates to talk about their issues. We're booking more through the end of January and into February. If you got a primary election race and you want to come on the podcast, again, hit us up on Instagram, Twitter, at Big Texas Podcast. But that's not what we're talking about right now. Uh, we're talking to Jenny about her race, her history, background, growing up here in the Austin area, uh, what led her to go to law school, her experience in D.C. during the Clinton administration, as well as her experience with redistricting uh, here in the Texas legislature. So uh, I had such a good time talking to her. Uh, I'm going to get out of the way, ladies and gentlemen. Without further ado, Jenny Roan Forge. HQ, our Very home excited to be here. Our home away from home. Uh, nine months on the campaign trail. Yes, sir. H how's it going for you out there? It's just getting started. This is the best part. Um, a lot of people don't know that I actually worked on dozens of campaigns back in 2001, and I remember sleeping on many floors, many mm -hmm. nights trying to get it done. I think you've been there yourself. Yeah. Uh, a few hotel uh, conference room floors, yeah. Sure, wherever you can catch a few Zs. Yep. I think I lived on Snicker bars for six <laughs> weeks or something. Um, anyway, my point is, is this is the last final push. This is where we all dig deep, everyone, from staffers to volunteers to candidates to donors, and step up and help out because we've got to get the word out. So thanks for doing this. Yeah, happy to do it. So uh, tell me a little bit more about your background and experience and kind of you know what led you to get into this race in particular. Sure. So I'm a native Austinite. I was born here just down the way at St. David's and um, grew up here, went to Doss Elementary School, Keeling Junior High and Anderson High School before I switched over and went to St. Stephen's, finished up there, uh, which was a blessing to be able to finish there. And the whole time I was, I am, I was the daughter of Forrest Roan, who w worked at the Capitol and worked in politics and was a lobbyist at one point and then left and had his own firm. So basically I lived eight and breathed Texas politics, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, my father instilled in me a love for this state, a love for our independence, a love for things like private property rights. You know, what five-year-old doesn't love talking about that? Yeah. <laughs> well, lemonade stand issues have brought, you know, the five-year-olds back mean, into the fray. My kids are very excited about the lemonade stand bill. Truthfully, we just talked about this the other day. So there you go. Although my daughter wants to have a hot chocolate stand. Oh, so. look, we applaud diversity here at the Big Texas <laughs> Podcast. Of course. Um, so anyway, I grew up in it and went to Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., where I studied international relations and got a degree in foreign service. Okay. Had plans to go into the State Department Foreign Service and take the exam, but I was there during the Clinton impeachment mm -hmm. and when the budget shut down and 
um, Mr. Gingrich was up there doing his thing, and so it was a little wild. I worked on Capitol Hill during that time, changed my plans, and came back to Texas because don't we all ultimately come back to Texas? Uh, it's hard. Uh, the fact that you left is impressive. You know, I, I, <laughs> I can only do, you know, maybe a few months at a time. It's tough being away. So came back home. Um, actually, during Georgetown, I also lived in Mexico City. So oh, wow. I lived there for a year and used to speak Spanish fluently. Now I'm just proficient. It's been a while. Um, came back, worked in some campaigns in 2001 during the cycle, including Senator Cornyn's first senatorial campaign, Governor Perry's first gubernatorial campaign, and then a bunch of other ones as a consultant. Um, and then I thought I'd take a break. That break turned into about 16 years, during which time I got married to my high school sweetheart, Justin, who went to Westlake High School. And we... Shout started, out to the state champs, Westlake. Hey, holla. So anyway, we um, got married. We met in church here downtown, actually, and got married and had kids, and we were doing our thing. I was kind of a stay-at-home mom, and I'd, I'd work in the margins, and we owned a couple of businesses, and then I started my own businesses, and he would kind of come home part-time and do his thing. And then, um, lo and behold, later on, sorry, I have to say, one of the cars, one of the businesses I owned was called Pink Car. So some people out there have been seeing my giant pink car, and that's where that comes from. So there you go. Was a, it was a female-owned limo company. Um, okay, so Justin and I were rocking and rolling as a family, and in 2015, he was diagnosed with his second neurological disorder. Oh, wow. And um, that is incurable. And on that day when I got that call from the doctor, and I'm sharing this story because I think all of us have something like this in our life, mm -hmm. no matter how old or young we are. Yep. Um, literally on my cell phone on a Saturday from an MD getting a call is terrifying. Yeah. Fell on my feet. I mean, fell on my knees and said, you know, God, what am I going to do? How am I going to help my family? Because this doctor just told me it's not going to get any better. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is what it is. So after a lot of prayer and counsel and seeking out, you know, different advice from different people, including my dad, I decided to um, put on my big girl pants and go to law school. Okay. So went to law school, Baylor Law, on a full ride scholarship. Wow. Uh, law school takes three years. Baylor's called the boot camp of law schools for a reason. It's very challenging. Mm -hmm. I did it in two years. I was published in Law Review. I started a leadership organization for my young peers at the mm -hmm. law school called Making a Difference mm -hmm. Council. Um, moved my family to Waco, which was tough, yeah. for my family. And then came back here as fast as I could because this is my home. And got back here in 2018 and started working. I'm an attorney, and I love being an attorney. I found my calling there. So what do you specialize in? So we're transactional and administrative, which means we help people when they have to go to the regulatory agencies before the state. Oh, okay. I also help small businesses. There you go. Um, do a lot of drafting to help people start their small businesses, which Excellent. I had done before uh -huh. as in a small business owner. Um, Easier uh, on the other side, having the legal uh, experience. Absolutely. <laughs> and I got to tell you, being a small business owner is one of the, is one of the hardest things I've ever done. Mm -hmm. So my hat's off to people who do that. It's yep. vital to our economic engine, vital to our families and our societies. And I'm a much better lawyer than I was a small business owner, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. Um, anyway, so... Here we are in 2018, and I was rocking and rolling again and thought, my life is all good. We're just going to live here and work here and be good. And then I had a conversation with someone that I've known a very long time who's very influential in politics and said, what's going on with my party? We need to sit down and have a conversation about this. Mm -hmm. I am shocked at what I see happening in the Republican Party today. And in 2018, the year of the woman, guess what? All those women who were elected do not reflect me. Yeah. So we have to step up as a Republican party. We have to get real. We have to have hard conversations and we have to shift the way we respond to the electorate because we are a government by the people for the people. So this friend looked at me and said, well, what are you going to do about it? Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, no, no, no. I have my kids. I have my husband. We're staying home for a while. And he, he, he said, well, you know, we need help. Redistricting's coming. Yeah. Well, I worked on redistricting in 2001. I'm the only candidate in the race on either side of the aisle who has redistricting experience. Mm -hmm. And as a result, I looked at him and went, uh-oh, you said the magic R word. I know, the listeners know, and you know, Travis County has 57 elected officials that are just from the county alone. Mm -hmm. One of those is a Republican, Gerald Dordery. Yep. He's retired. All six reps right now are Democrats. Mm -hmm. Whether you're a D or an R, that should bother you. Yeah. We need better, more balanced representation because I promise you not every member, not every citizen of Travis County is a Democrat. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
I'm proof of that. Yeah. <laughs> so. There's a few of us here. I mean, the Travis County Republican Party would not exist if there weren't at least a smattering of, you know, GOP reflection in the in the citizenry. I'd say there's more than a smattering. <laughs> I, think, I think we've got a good showing and we're going to show up in uh, 2020 and it's going to be great. Yeah, yeah. So... Uh, I, that was under a Democrat-controlled uh, legislature, correct, in 2001? Yes. If I remember correctly, yes. It was right before um, Speaker Craddock became Speaker. Yeah. So, I mean, for for those who don't remember what it was like, uh, <laughs> you know, in era without Republican control, you sure. know, what is your message to the Republicans who maybe aren't taking this this cycle as seriously as they should? Sure. Um, I my short answer is take it seriously. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have said to me on the trail, principle over victory. Doesn't matter if we win in November, we need X, Y, Z, and they name whatever their litmus test is. Mm -hmm. And frankly, that's not true. It, from my point of view, I absolutely believe that we need, first of all, we need to be able to work together as a society. We all live together. We should, when I grew up in the 70s and 80s in Austin, you could have vehement, disagreements. I mean, knock down, drag out. I fundamentally think you are wrong. I think you're wrong in the way you think. Mm -hmm. And then you could go buy that person a beer or they would buy you a beer or whiskey or whatever, yep. because we understood we're fighting for policy and we're fighting for the good of te Texas overall. And it's not about you or me personally. It's about something bigger than us. Mm -hmm. That's not what we experience today. Today, it is very us versus them. It is very evil versus righteousness in everyone's language. Um, there are opponents in my Republican primary who love to talk about war and how we are at war. And I will tell you, I am a peacemaker. Mm -hmm. And I'm a peacemaker because honestly, most moms and even a lot of dads are longing for a peacemaker. Mm -hmm. We want somebody who will go to the state capitol who knows how to negotiate, which guess what? I do. I'm a lawyer. That's what I do for a living. Yeah. Who knows how to disagree well, but can still get something done at the end of the day instead of what happened in 2017, where we had to go to a special and spend millions of taxpayer dollars on something that truthfully most people don't care about at the end of the day, yeah. especially out in the suburbs in HG47. Well, and when you bring up the subject of redistricting, you know, for the most part, people just listen to the rhetoric and don't get into the real nitty gritty of what it takes to go through that process. I mean, it's a year and a half of committee hearings that are taking place right now in the interim. That's right. Uh, so I, uh, there's Can so I many tell you a story. About yeah. Redistricting? Uh, oh, please. I love <laughs> I'm not going to tell you a good one oh. because, <laughs> because those are, those are private. No, just kidding. Um, I remember, I think I was, let's see, I was 22, 23 when this was going on. So for me, pretty young, wide-eyed, still yeah. so impressed by the Capitol and everything that was going on there, which I still am today. I love democracy. And one of my jobs was to go observe committee hearing meetings. So I would sit in those hours and hours mm -hmm. of public testimony, which I loved doing because I remember one day a woman came from Houston from her community. It was a Vietnamese community, and she was just pleading with the committee, please don't draw a line. The current and, and a lot of people don't understand this. You go through hundreds of maps when yeah. you're in redistricting. You have a Democrat map. You have a Republican map. You have a this caucus map, a that caucus map. You have a Travis County map. You go through lots of versions after you look at a lot of data. And this woman was saying, you know, this map right here that y'all are considering is going to literally split my family in half. I mean, my aunts and uncles live across this street and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And we all speak the same language. So that has always stuck with me. Redistricting is a highly political process. You have to have a very thick skin. It's the worst of humanity, to mm -hmm. be honest. Um, it's self-interest on display. But at the end of the day, you want someone there, at least I want someone there, who remembers the Vietnamese lady who drove up from Houston. Who, this makes a difference in her life. Yeah. She needs to have access to her representative, and so does her whole community. Mm -hmm. Well, and redistricting is going to dominate so much uh, of the next session. What do you think are some of the other issues, or what are the issues that voters are talking to you about that are you know top, top priority for them? Absolutely. So we've been out in the district block walking for... I mean, months and months. And that's my favorite thing to do because you get to talk to real people. Every single one of them says property taxes mm -hmm. from the wealthy to the not as wealthy. 
every single person in the district is concerned about property taxes, and so am I. I mean, when we moved back from Waco, we could not believe in simply two years what has happened in our hometown. Yeah. The, the cost of living here is honestly ridiculous. Um, so property taxes, and then the second thing that everyone talks about is transportation and traffic. Mm-hmm. I say this a lot because I fundamentally believe this. Transportation is a life and death issue. It is a small business issue. It is a quality of life issue. It is a family values issue. I currently spend, I live, I think, 12, less than 12 miles from my job, and I spend an hour and a half every day in the car away from my children because I can't afford to live closer, Mm -hmm. property taxes, and there is no road capacity in Austin, yep. so traffic congestion. I'll say also on traffic, recently um, I was in a situation where someone I know needed an ambulance, and I was sitting with her waiting for the ambulance. We were literally blocks away from the hospital, and it took 45 minutes for the ambulance to arrive Yeah, because they had been on a call on Mopac, and when we built our lanes on Mopac, there is no shoulder for the first responders. Yeah. So this really is a life and death thing. Um, and, you know, we've had way too many wrecks, way too many deaths in House District 47. So we just, we need someone who's going to be a strong advocate on transportation. And it's absolutely my top two, property taxes and transportation. Excellent. So if any issues come up that maybe have you surprised you a little bit when you're at the door and a voter says, you know, uh, this is the thing that I'm concerned about, any oddball issues or anything like that? Generally, no, but I will tell you one kind of funny, uh, it's not funny, but it made me smile. Um, My husband actually went campaigning last night. He went out to a bar because one of the things that we really believe in as a couple, either he's a, he's a youth minister. So either in ministry, which is where we met or in politics or in our life generally is you go to where the people are and you meet them where they're at. Mm -hmm. You don't condescend to them. You don't ask them to come to you. You get out there and, and do your best, right? So last night he was at a bar and he um, texted me and said, well, everybody here wants marijuana to be legalized. And I said, okay, well, good feedback. Good to know. Mm -hmm. I fundamentally believe with my whole heart that the job of a representative is to represent the people. It is not about my agenda. Now, having said that, I have principles that totally and completely are going to dictate the way I think about an issue. Mm -hmm. And I want the voters to know what those principles are. I believe in limited government. I believe in small government. I believe in low taxes. I believe in freedom. I want people to be able to build their businesses and support their churches and support their charities. I think that's the best way for us to live together in a society. So you guys can all know that. You've all heard me say that. Mm -hmm. That's that's how I'm going to think about every issue. But Wait, now see, I started to ramble. What mm-hmm. was I talking about? We're, well, your husband was in a bar. Yeah, we were and talking about marijuana. May have, may I not mean, been. It's, you know. it's, it's like I, I just, no, I'm just kidding. Um, anyway, we, I don't have an agenda on marijuana. I don't have a policy position on marijuana one way or the other. I think it needs to be data-driven and not emotionally driven, our response to it. I believe that it costs us way too much money or the way we have been prosecuting marijuana in the past. Mm -hmm. And we need to look at that. And honestly, on every level in criminal justice reform, we need to look at how much we're spending from the taxpayer dollar perspective. And then also our, we're the party of life and we need to be pro-life up and down Mm -hmm. and sideways and all around, right? Including um, any way that we can reduce risk recidivism, I think is a good thing. Yeah. So uh, to that end, criminal justice reform has kind of launched to the, to the forefront of, you know, federal politics. It's certainly being discussed more and more uh, at the state level. You know, what is this, where do you stand on criminal justice reform? There's a bail reform measure on the primary ballot uh, for the party. You know, uh, what kind of discussions are having in this area? Sure. So first of all, I'll, I'll be really honest with you. HD 47 voters are not asking about this. Okay. So we need to put that out there. However, as we all know, when you go to the legislature, there are a whole heck of a lot of things you vote on that your voters, your constituents in your district uh, literally have no, they have no interest in it. Yeah. But we still have to vote on it because we're a big diverse state, which is mm-hmm. great. So criminal justice reform, we need to have criminal justice reform. I think that's a given. I'm really grateful that that's a given. The specifics, I'm not going to get into too many specifics because I'm not an expert and I need to be better educated on the issue. I will tell you that one thing I love, I heard Chief Justice Nathan Heck talk about this about a year and a half ago. 
Um, he told a great story about the relationship between poverty and which is a real thing. Mm-hmm. That we as Republicans need to grapple with poverty and mental health and our jail system. And he had this one liner in his speech. He said, the jail system should not be a mental health hospital. And I 100 percent agree with that. And I applaud the courts creating the mental health consortium. I don't know if you all know this, everybody out there. But for the first time in the history of our courts, the Court of Criminal Appeals and the Texas Supreme Court met en banc together in order to hear about this issue specifically, mm-hmm. mental health in our criminal justice system. So, Yeah, and that's an issue that certainly at the county level, you hear a, a lot of county administrators, you know, jail administrators, local law enforcement talk about how, you know, criminal justice has kind of become the catch-all for these types of issues. Mm -hmm. And it is driving up our property taxes. It's driving up a whole host of issues that we're dealing with. So uh, I'm glad that you're, you're going to get more informed on that issue. Um, You know, at this 2020 is a tough cycle, right? Sure. Uh, And you, you talked about it, how we need a change of identity in the party. There are a lot of women running for office which I'm thrilled about. Me too. My mom is thrilled about. Hey. Right? <laughs> Hi, mom. <laughs> she, so I guess from your perspective as a candidate who happens to be a woman, you know, how how do you break into the forefront? How, how do you get ahead of a pack and, you know, you're yourself in a five-way race? So how do you come to the front as a female candidate? Well, first of all, I come to the front as being the best candidate and the most qualified. So I have the most experience. I have small business experience. I have, I'm have. i an attorney, so I understand the regulatory environment, which is a, the lion's share of what happens at the legislature mm-hmm. as we regulate the regulators, right? Yep. Um, <clears throat> and then I just have family history. I just know the process. I know what happens, and, and I like to say I know where the bodies are buried. I don't know where all of them are buried, but some of them. Um, Hopefully in the state cemetery, mostly. <laughs> yeah, one would hope. <laughs> So um, being the best candidate, first of all, and second of all, I say this often on the trail and I mean it. Unfortunately, we're the party that resists any conversation around um, identity politics for good reason. Yeah. We want the best person for the job. We actually really, truly believe in equality. Church. So we look yeah. at people as people, right? And what I said to my friend in that meeting last February, I still believe today to be true. Well, we can espouse that all we want, but that's not the reality we live in today. That's not what the voters want. Yeah. The voters understand something that is also true, mm-hmm. which is that being a woman makes me different than a man. Being, if I were black, it would make me different than if I were white. I'm white. But being a redhead makes me different than my blonde husband. You know, everything that we have that makes each one of us us brings something to bear on our worldview. And it is true that women tend to be peacemakers, negotiators. I mean, in 2017, we almost had a fist fight on the floor of the house in Texas. Yeah, I remember Sine die. What yeah. in the world? And if you go back and watch that, the women were standing back. All the men were in the fray, bowing up, and the women were standing back looking around going, what is happening? Mm-hmm. Because it's just silly and unnecessary. So, you know, I'm speaking in huge overarching generalizations, which I generally don't like to do mm-hmm. <laughs> because... You know, just because you're a woman doesn't mean you're necessarily a peacemaker. But I think being home, you know, we like to take care of the home. We like to bring everybody together and create a sense of peace. And I think that that is necessary in the environment we're in right now. Well, I I know that the the women who already are Republican representatives in the House would welcome you with open arms. That'd be great. Uh, But to that broader message, right, one of the questions that we're asking uh, all candidates and, and really you know, fellow voters, you know, our neighbors and friends, or, or we get the question a lot. Why are you Republican? And in a district that has gone Democrat now, uh, Rice University put out their hot races or whatever their title is. Mm-hmm. This one leans Democrat. What is your message to the voters on why they should consider a Republican candidate this cycle? Sure. I love that question. I'm smiling for those of you at home who can't see my face. I'm smiling because um, I wrestled with this. There was a time in my life where I went a pox on all your houses. I'm so sick of everyone, Democrats and Republicans. All of you go away. I'm not going to I'm going to be apolitical. There was a time in my life when I mean, it was about a hot minute. But I thought, oh, maybe I'll be a liberal Democrat feminist. And I tried that on when I was young. And then I went, oh, no, no, that's Mm -hmm. not for me. So 
I have wrestled with the identity of what it means to be a Republican, and I chose it because I really do believe at the end of the day, choice, free market principles, being able to self-govern and maintain your self-sovereignty is the best system in a world where we'll never have a perfect system, Mm -hmm. right? So I believe at the end of the day, it's better for you, Jordan, to be able to choose how you're going to spend your money and live your life and um, spend your time and your resources in your community than X county commissioner or Y city council person or Z state rep saying, nope, now you need to put your resources into this program. I believe that that is the better system for all of us. And one of the reasons I believe that is because I worked on Capitol Hill. When I worked on Capitol Hill, I was shocked and appalled, shocked and appalled at the way our own human nature forces us, it doesn't force us, we tend towards this, it's like entropy, we tend towards this self-interest, self-preservation, and we don't ever want to leave once we have something. Once we have power, we hold on to it, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why I just signed the U.S. Term Limits Pledge, because I believe that we need to create unfortunately, limits Mm -hmm. um, out there because otherwise we will just grow and grow and grow and grow this big government. I'm excited, so I'm kind of rambling. Am I answering your question? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) No. uh, So uh, uh, on term limits, are you uh, talking specifically at the federal level? or Okay. Yeah, and the reason I I used to, I actually thought, should we have them at the state level? The reason I'm a little hesitant at the state level is because of the role of staff. I don't want the staff to become the expert. I really believe in a citizen legislature. I want the legislators to go and represent and debate and muck it up in there and represent the people. Mm -hmm. So, um, but the federal system is, is what it is. We don't have to go there. (laughs) I think we need to place some sort of parameters around that system. Well, and our focus is on Texas. uh, And, you know, something that's kind of really irked me in in this run up to the 2020 cycle is so much of the conversation on the left end of the spectrum is about just flipping the house, taking control. You know, the one thing I have noticed in, in this discussion with you is you haven't used any of that kind of language. This isn't about flipping the district. It seems like you generally, genuinely want to represent your district, vote your district, and have that conversation with the constituents. Sure. And, you know, not to name names, I'm glad you pointed that out. Last weekend was a really good example. There was something that blew up online um, between one of the people who is an opponent of mine in the Republican primary and a large number of constituents in the district. And that person who's my opponent was talking in pretty us versus them. We're going to take it back. We're going to flip it. We're going to, anyway, war type language. Mm -hmm. And it completely made everyone feel sick to their stomach who was listening. So what we all have to be cognizant of, especially because, you know, we're here in the Republican Party of Texas headquarters. This is where people who love politics come. Yeah. We live, eat, and breathe this stuff. Mm -hmm. Most people don't. I mean, I will tell you this. I know we're running short on time. I have so many stories. But when I first decided to run for office, I gathered a group of women in the suburbs, and I sat down with them and said, here's who I am. Here's what I stand for. What do you think? And I didn't know if they were Republican or Democrat. I didn't know if they were independent. It didn't matter. They were my friends who are in my similar life place. And they all said, what's the state legislature? What do you mean? What does that do? Are Mm -hmm. you talking about going to D.C.? And so this is what we're talking about, y'all. Most people are not dialed in the way you and I are dialed in right here. They literally want to be able to afford their groceries, get their kids to school, get home in time to get a good dinner on the table, and have some job security and Lord, please help me afford my property taxes. Yeah, That is what we should do at the local level. Mm -hmm. So why have a conversation about anything else? Yeah. Well, uh, and that's a perfect transition as we uh, wrap up here. You know, what is your message to voters? Why are you the candidate for HD 47? Well, I'm the candidate for HD 40. Well, I'm not going to say I'm the candidate. I should be the representative for HD 47 because I truly want to listen to the voters' concerns, the constituents' concerns, and do my level best to go and represent them, always remembering what I believe a Republican is, someone who's pro-limited government, anti-big tax, and fighting for freedom. 
so that you can make decisions about how you want to live your life. That's why. Uh, the other thing I would say is that I will listen. I will listen. And I will listen to people who are different than me. And then I will try to create a consensus that we can all live with. There you go. Short and sweet. Real easy to digest. Uh, anything else you want to bring up uh, before we wrap sure. up here? Sure. We would love your support. So anybody <laughs> out there, we would love um, volunteer help, yard signs, uh, donations are still always welcome. It's expensive to run a campaign. My website is www.jennyroanforgy.com. Facebook is at Jenny Roan Forgy and Instagram is at Jenny Roan Forgy. You guys hop on board, sign up to get emails and get involved. Not on Twitter. Well, my Twitter is my personal Twitter. Oh, so okay. I don't want to go there. Uh, yeah, no worries. <laughs> All right, well, Jenny, thank you so much for coming in and talk to us. Uh, we appreciate it and best of luck on the campaign trail. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you again to Jenny for joining us on the Big Texas podcast. Again, if you want to find Jenny, you can find her on Facebook or you can go to her website, JennyRoanForgy.com. Uh, thank you again. Again, if you are a candidate in HD 47 and you want to come on this podcast, hit up, hit us up on Twitter and Instagram at Big Texas Podcast. Uh, and be sure you are subscribing on iTunes, Spitter. Spitter, Spotify, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Anchor, wherever you get your podcasts. There's a, even an app out there called Podcast Addict or Pod Addict, something like that. I don't know. If if we are not on your platform, let us know and we will be sure and get there. As always, friends, I appreciate you for listening, for taking part, for hitting us up on social media. We look forward to bringing you many more candidates. Until then, friends, we'll see you down the road.